prior to John coming forth to read the scripture from which he's preaching. Oh man, there's lights on here. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Hey, Mr. D. All right, we're going to be in the book of 1 Timothy, um, and we're in chapter 1. We're going to be in verses uh, 18, 18 through 20, so 18, 19, and 20. And um, also we have uh, Pastor John Toon who's joined us today from, from East Shore Baptist Church. He's going to be, uh, you've heard today is uh, ordination service for, uh, for, for John Nicholas. Uh, so we have to get all our just John Nicholas jokes in now. In about uh, 45 minutes, it'll be Pastor John Nicholas. So we pick on him for now. Um, John has been in charge of uh, accolades and awards here for, uh, for a long time, and he will retain that. Uh, he'll still retain that position. Um, and uh, we are a church who does issue demerits. There were no demerits issued this morning yet. Uh, Ed has a quarter demerit for, uh, for not having the uh, slide lyrics in, but uh, a crack team of experts back there got slides, uh, t- songs two and three in just in the nick of time. So... Um, I think that the uh, closing songs are in there, so now everything is, is squared away. So we'll be in the book of 1 Timothy. Uh, last week, we were in, we, we, we've been in Timothy now for, I guess, four weeks or so, um, rounding out the, uh, the first chapter here. And last week, we saw this really interesting picture of, of Paul. Um, interesting character, wrote the majority of the New Testament texts. Um, but when, when he was originally found, where God originally found him, he would actually have been a hater of the New Testament church that he ended up being so instrumental in planting. And I think you can look at someone like Paul and think, hero of the faith, look at all these amazing things he did and think, what a great guy. And Paul would have you do just the opposite. Uh, in fact, we saw him last week saying he's the chief of all sinners, um, the blasphemer, and if God could save him, God can save anyone. And, and that's really the point of, of Paul and Paul's ministry. Scripturally, we would read that God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And so Paul is part of that picture. Paul said that he was a, a blasphemer, chief of sinners, um, and, and really downplayed his own self so that God would be seen as magnificent in saving him. And so we said that uh, Paul himself was to be an example of the great depth of God's love. And more than that, then, Paul was charged by that. That was his excitement. That was his joy to know that God had saved him, put a, a pep in his step, if you will, a little extra bounce. Um, And what's interesting, too, is the account of Paul's salvation. Paul was not out looking for God. He was not looking for a God-shaped hole in his heart that he could plug in with a sovereign creator of the universe who had a marvelous plan for his life. Rather, Paul had letters in his pocket so that he could take back the Christian believers and maybe kill them, certainly imprison them. And God found him where he was. And saved him in an instant and made clear his grace in an absolute instant to Paul. And so that's the point. And so God is glorified by taking Paul, kicking and screaming, and making him love the story of God's gospel in a moment. Paul, the chief sinner, the resister, the blasphemer. But God in his great grace and his love and his mercy saved Paul. And that is really the point of Paul's life and Paul's ministry. This week we'll see Paul charge Timothy to engage in a kind of a warfare. And we learn a lot about the context just from these few verses of pastoral warfare. And so it's certainly interesting timing now with John, um, John's ordination and, and the charge that John Toon, uh, now referred to as officially JT, the charge that JT will bring. Uh, for John this morning, I'm sure will be um, in the spirit of the charge that Paul gives to Timothy. And I've not seen what you've written, so hopefully I'm just taking it all from you. You're welcome. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18 together. Paul writes to Timothy, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, In accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. This charge I entrust to you, Paul says to Timothy, 
Which is interesting because if you look back just, just, the, just the smallest bit backwards from where we are in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 11, here's what Paul would say of himself. In accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God in which I have been entrusted. Paul is not making something new for the benefit of Timothy. Paul is saying, I have been entrusted with the gospel, with the gospel ministry. And now, Timothy, you are entrusted with the gospel and the gospel ministry. And we've said that this book, the book of 1 Timothy, is from a pastor to a pastor. But it's just as relevant today as it was when it was originally penned. That same trust is placed in the church today that Paul had for Timothy, that Timothy had for the people he passed it on to, and why we have the doctrinal soundness that we're able to have recorded in Scripture today. And so that is to be entrusted to us as we carry it out through generations. Paul is passing wisdom down to Timothy, who he calls his child in the faith. Somebody asked one time, there's this little dot and there's like some people in there, and I'm referring to the little red dot down in the corner of that slide. Um, when, when we started kind of putting together, I say we, me and a crack team of nine graphic artists uh, and a few creative writers that we have on staff here, started really talking about this message. Um, and the, 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 the picture in the background, if you could see it on our, on our series, is actually a picture of the outside of the building, concept being that... that this blood-bought message of the gospel has been passed down through faithful people into the church that we still carry today. Nothing has changed. The gospel is the same. The message is the same. The job of the church is the same. Sometimes we confuse it with lots of fancy things, whether or not we get song lyrics in on time, those kinds of things. These are all tertiary to the, to the, to the job of the church, which is to be the tangible witness of the glory of God that people gather and worship him and then continue throughout their days and tell others about the great glory of their God and the amazing saving work that is available to them through Jesus. That's, that's our existence on this earth. Um, often I think we get caught up by all the things that we have to do. Like, I don't know, you know, there's these people out there, they're weird, and if you're one of them, you're weird. They're, they're, I think they call themselves, uh, Steph thinks I'm going to say flat earth people. It's not true, but they're weird. Um, it's the zero inbox people. You know what I'm talking about? The people that think that you have to have no emails in your inbox at any given time. I can immediately drive them all crazy because I, at any given time, have 47,000 plus new emails um, in my inbox. Um, which is, just speaks to, I guess, the insanity of my brain. Um, but we can get so caught up in our day-to-day -day lives, right, that work is really important, and we have to do a really good job. And, and certainly that's true. It is important. We do need to do a good job. We need to have a Christian witness. But that can become your entire identity. One of the first things we do when we meet another person is say, oh, what do you do? What, what does that matter? Who cares? I'm just as guilty as the next person, but really, who cares? Is that what defines someone for you? We can get so busy in our however many years of life that we get that the tertiary becomes the primary. We start to concentrate only on getting things done in our nine-to-five jobs. That's why the Sabbath was for the man. You know, you would um, imagine that you, you built things for a living, right? Maybe you build chairs. And you work and you work and you work. Maybe you have a particularly productive week. And you made a chair, or maybe two chairs. I don't know how long it takes to make a chair. Maybe you made two in your six days of work. And then you sit back and you rest and you participate in the Sabbath and you think, man, I'm good. I made two chairs this week. And then you think about all that God did in those same six days and it reminds you of who you are and who he is and what this life is and what this life is for. That's a healthy pattern to remember who we are and what our jobs and what our work are. They're important, but they're secondary there's so much more to life than all the busyness that keeps us all frenzied and riled up. So Paul writes this letter to Timothy and gives him this charge, his, his child in the faith, so that all churches for all times should be faithful to this message until the Lord should come back. And so we too are entrusted then with this similar kind of a deposit. I mean, that's a, that's a duty of the church 
to be entrusted with the deposit that was given from Paul to Timothy and for us to carry it and for us to care and for us to want to accurately carry that message and that deposit without adding to it, without taking from it. Our job is to present God's plan, not to reauthor God's plan. And so Paul passes this on to Timothy, a pastor to a pastor, saying, deliver this to future generations. Do it sharply. Do it without error. And treat it as a matter of warfare, we'll see. That by them, you may wage the good warfare. Timothy had been prophesied about beforehand. Um, And the interesting thing about, about prophecy, here's the interesting thing about prophecy. When God says a prophecy, it comes completely true. Because God is a forth teller, not a foreteller. I had a buddy um, who who was in the Navy, and um, his job was air traffic control weather person. And it's you know it's pretty humorous actually to talk with him because he was rated on his accuracy. And I I think like a good accuracy was considered thirty percent, thirty percent on being able to tell you. I feel like I could do that by licking my thumb and sticking it up in the air and and looking at the sky. I feel like I could get to 30% accuracy. But that's what they wanted him to come up with on the weather. God does not do that. God prophesies and says not, here's what I think is going to happen. God prophesies what will happen. It's a very interesting dichotomy. It's a, a difference in God's being sovereign. He is in complete and total control. Nothing happens outside of his sovereignty. If you ever read the book of Job, it's a pretty interesting book. Um, and, and one of my favorite things about the book of Job, it's, it's hard to narrow that down, but here's one of my favorites, is um, there's basically this great exchange between God and between Satan. And, and Satan says, Job listens to you because you bless him and you give him whatever he wants. And God says, fine, do what you want to him, but don't touch his health. Now here's the thing about Satan. If Satan were allowed to touch Job's health, meaning make him sick, give him boils full of worms, make him physically uncomfortable, he would absolutely do that. But he didn't at first. And then they go to round two and he says, well, you didn't let me touch his health. And so that's why. And so God says, fine, touch his health. Here's what I love about that. Satan is completely under God's control. He goes no further than God allows. Think about that. That's interesting. That's, that's amazing. I think sometimes we give the power of Satan too much credit. Am I suggesting that you should look to fight the power of Satan? No, I'm going to suggest that you should avoid that world. <laughs> but when God prophesies, it comes true. Uh, I remember when I first came to town, I went to a local church in the area because I was invited by someone. I was really struggling to find a place that my family and I were going to be able to plug in. Um, and somebody invited me to their church, and I said, okay, cool, yeah, I'll join you. And I go, and I walked up, and, and they weren't there, and it was really big. And they had a coffee shop, right? So I went and I got myself some coffee. And then they had a bookstore, and I said, oh, cool, let me go see what kind of books they have. And I went in, and I, hadn't, I, I looked on the shelf, and I didn't know a single author that was on the shelf. And I thought, well, that's weird. I read a good bit. You'd think I'd know someone, but I don't know anybody on this shelf. So I go back to the coffee shop because if you've been around me for more than five minutes, you know I drink a lot of coffee. So it was time for another cup. So I go in and I'm pumping the coffee and the guy comes up to me and he says, oh, it looks like it's going to snow out there. And I said, yeah, I know. I, I, I think it does. And he said, well, I'm not prophesying. And I, I remember just thinking, that's the weirdest. Well, of course you're not, dude. You're just a guy. I mean, you might be guessing at the weather, but of course you're not prophesying. And I said, well, that's good, because you know what the Bible says about someone whose prophecy doesn't come true. And I'm waiting for my laugh curve. Nothing. There's so much bad theology in the world. It's terrible. And I know that doesn't sound significant, but that's very significant. If you have an environment where you have people walking around that think they prophesy, they think they speak truth about the future for God, that's terrifying. That is absolutely terrifying. And if you run into that, run from that. This is what Timothy is charged with. Warfare against bad theology. Bad theology hurts people. Now, I know it doesn't seem significant that he said it was going to snow in the future. And you're probably right, it's not significant. But what about when that same guy goes to someone and says, Hey, I have a prophecy about your health. Oh, your baby's sick? 
Bring your baby to me. I'll pray for your baby. We'll make your baby better. I know where you could take your baby sick. I know where you could go and pray for that baby and you'll get healing. They get healing. Have you ever heard those commercials on the radio before? That is bad, sick, evil theology. Don't participate in that. Now, should we pray for one another? Absolutely. Should we ask God, if it's your will, would you do a miraculous healing? Absolutely. Do we hold that power and can we offer that to others? No. No, we can't. It's very important that the charge that was trusted to Timothy be respected. It was spoken of by Paul as warfare. Now, I don't know about you, but warfare to me doesn't sound comfortable. Warfare to me doesn't seem like kind of a cozy environment where you say something wrong and I just kind of say, that's okay, little buddy. You can say whatever you want about God's truth. Just play with it. Have fun with it. Paul trust Timothy with a deposit of truth and says protect it Timothy like it's warfare sometimes I think we can struggle to appreciate the sovereignty of God we can struggle to appreciate the great power of God and I you know if you're ever feeling like that I want you to turn to your Bible to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 and read verse 1 and ask yourself Do I believe this? Because here's what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, guys, if that's true, if in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and you've looked at the heavens and the earth before, right? What are we really impressed with ourselves right now? Because we've seen further into space than we ever have before. Have you, did you see the pictures of that on the news recently? It's this blurry thing that vaguely looks like a peanut. God created all of that with the power of his word, with no pre-existing material. It's not like he gathered up a bunch of stuff and kind of made it, you know, and spent some time crafting. No glue, glitter. He just said And it was. Nothingness obeyed and became substance. And so the God that said, let there be and created the heavens and the earth, is sovereign over all things, including the enemy. Paul makes a deposit in Timothy. According to what God planned, that Timothy has a duty to carry out, to wage warfare. Wage warfare against what? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Paul had already talked to Timothy about the kinds of warfare that he was going to encounter. As I urged you, verse 3, as I urged you, as I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. Not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from what? From God that is by faith. There's so much of this today. There's so much of this chasing after genealogies and myths and things. God's word is rich. And we're to trust it. That's what the church is to teach and pass on. There's a warfare in the world between good and evil, between God and Satan. And in the end, we know God's going to win this thing. Right? It's kind of unfair, really. The odds should be pretty much bad. Right? If you went to Vegas, you probably wouldn't make much money by, by, by putting your money on, on God to win it. And so we are supposed to dutifully participate on the winning side. To me, this feels like a no-brainer. 1 Timothy 19 and 20. This starts to get at the how. And, and I love this, just this first part of verse 19 holding faith and a good conscience. This is what Timothy is to do. Hold faith and a good conscience. 
How do you do that? The conscience is an interesting thing. And you have to be really careful talking to folks about conscience because um, Jesus' yoke is light. It's not a burden. We, we, we have this freedom because of what Jesus has already bought, but our conscience reminds us of things that might distance us or start to grow a gulf between us and God. And so we are supposed to listen to our conscience. In fact, um, you'll see later in, in Scripture that the, the Bible will say in the final days, people will be after teachers that just kind of itch the ears, right? That say things that they want to hear. They think it's neat, it's nothing to do with God, most probably. And their consciences, those teachers, their consciences are seared by ignoring them, right? It's like uh, one time I had a finger injury, right? It sounds simple, but it hurt really bad. And so the bottom of my finger um, got split, okay? And it grew back, I guess. Not the finger, but the split. The skin grew back. And, but even still to this day, like when I rub it, I, don't, if, I feel that there's pressure, but I can't really feel it, right? It's kind of numb, And that's what scripture talks about with the conscience. If you ignore it, and you ignore it, and you ignore it, it goes numb. And so the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to live within us, to remind us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. If we ignore that, we can become numb to it. We can get to the point that we kind of don't even feel the conscience anymore. And we can start to grow away, we can start to drift away from God. And specifically... For this pastor, teacher, Paul's child in the faith, who is supposed to hold this entrusted deposit closely, he is to hold the faith and have a good conscience. Um, If you were to go out working, right, let's say you're doing some construction project, and you, you know, you, you whack yourself in the thumb. You know what's going to happen next. You're going to hit that same thumb again. I don't know why. It's just science. Okay? It's just like if you bite your cheek on the inside of your mouth, right? You know what you're going to do. You're going to bite that sucker again. Now, with, with, the, with the hammer example, there may be some reasons that you did that. Maybe, like, you know, you were working with, with John Nicholas, and uh, he's talking to you. He's not working. He's there. And he's talking, and he's talking, and he's talking, and he's talking. And so maybe you decide you're going to give him the time of the day. So you look up from what you're doing, and you whack yourself in the thumb. Okay? It hurts. Right? You could treat that pain. You can put some ice on it or something like that. And then you go back to work. And you're working with John. So he's talking, and he's talking, and he's talking. And you know... If you look up again while you're swinging that hammer, you're going to hit yourself in the hand again, right in that same thumb, right? Or you can correct your course. You can stop listening to him. Look at the thing that you're nailing and not hit yourself in the thumb again, right? Our consciences can be like that. Maybe your conscience is is telling you that there's something that's up in your life. Maybe that's the Spirit of God in you telling you you're distancing from God. You're allowing this thing to, to, to grow a gap between you and God. You can tend to treat the conscious. I don't want to feel bad. I don't want to feel sad. I, I don't want to feel guilty. And so I start trying to feel better about that. Maybe I tell myself, ah, no, it's okay. I'm okay the way I am. This thing is really okay. I just need to kind of puff myself up and, and get back to it. And so the conscious can become numb when you do that. And so we need to keep a short account with sin. We need to keep ourselves in check. We need to pray. We need to say, God, do I need some correction in my life sometimes? This was important to Timothy being able to keep the charge that was entrusted to him. You know, there's interesting instances in Scripture where God has allowed people to be in places and be surrounded by things and and, and have things in their environment that keep them aware of Him. Right? That maybe their conscience is just pricked and it draws them closer to Him. You know, it's it's so funny. We just we want to be comfortable in this life. And I get it. I want to be comfortable too. I'm not a big pain guy. Okay? Um, but there are things that are so much more important than our comfort in this life. And sometimes maybe God needs to get our attention so that we're drawn back to Him. 
You see in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, kind of sticking with the theme of Paul here. Paul says, so 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10 is, is the greater context of what's going on. Well, here, I'll just read it. It reads like this. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Now, if you ever hang out around smart Christians, they'll constantly try to guess at what this thorn is. And then I will tell you, that is missing the point. It doesn't matter what the thorn is. A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Now here's the important part, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's an amazing perspective. I'll tell you, that is likely not Paul's natural perspective. That is certainly not my natural perspective. But imagine the short account that that perspective gives you. And then see that God is active in that. God actively made sure that he had this thorn in the flesh. And it was a help to him. It brought him back to God. Constantly reminded that he needed more of God. That he needed more of grace. And then rather than kind of hide that away, Paul made a big deal out of it. And said, look how gracious God is. An element in his life that was left there by God to keep him needful. I think for us, that gives us opportunity to ask, is there anything in me that's needful of God? I mean, we're Americans. We're pretty not needful. I mean, really soon, we're going to have robots that fly to our house and bring us everything we need within a few minutes. I think, like, you can get from that company that starts with an A. I think creepers will come and put the stuff you bought in the trunk of your car, right? I mean, what, what are we needful of? But we could fall into that trap and think, well, what am I needful of? How am I going to go hungry? I get it. How am I going to go hungry? I could just go to the grocery store and buy food. I don't have that need. But Jesus reminded us that when you pray, pray like this. He reminded us to be thankful to God for our daily provision. And so rather than think we're not needful, all this could go away in a moment. You ever seen what happens in a town when the power goes off, when the gas supply gets cut off, when, the, when a hurricane is coming? Forget about it. There's not water in town for miles. I remember in Harrisburg a few years back when some poor contractor accidentally broke a supply line working on um, fire hydrants, right? And all the grocery stores, man, you saw people coming out of there with like carts full of water, more than they could drink for months. We forget that we're so needful and dependent to God. Every night I go to sleep and I get reminded yet again how needful I am of God. Because after however many hours of struggling to breathe and choking while I sleep, I wake up and think, I was, conscious, I was completely unconscious of anything that was happening to me for the last four and a half hours. I don't even know how I survived that. I didn't remind my heart to breathe. I didn't remind my lungs to bring in air. I didn't do anything. God sustained my life. He sustained my body. You ever wonder why you not forget about even breathing while you're awake? You ever wonder how you breathe while you're asleep? Why does your heart beat? Why is there oxygen in the atmosphere to give your body life? We're needful of God in every moment. Paul says, We're going to have to drive on a little more quickly than I would like to here. Um, here's how 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20 ends. Holding faith and a good conscience by rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith. Among whom are, and he names some names that you won't see in scripture any more beyond this necessarily. Are they teachers? Are they members of the church? 
Are they people in Ephesus? Paul is dealing with specific issues in the church. But what he's demonstrating is that by ignoring the conscience, by getting away from true doctrine, getting away from the pure deposit that's given to us, faithfully handed to us in the word, our faith can be injured, it can wander, it can wane. And so this job that Timothy has been given is incredibly important. And so it's important that he stays behind in Ephesus and wages a kind of a warfare against false teaching, applying tactics and strategies. And so this is the charge that follows through to the church for pastors today. As a pastor, we're to be aware of the kinds of doctrinal errors that exist in our day. It's important. And there's more than a few to go around. That is to be battled against. We must engage in that warfare. And as the church, as members of the church, we need to be aware of those things as well so that when we hear it, we say, wait, 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 that's not right. We're not telling people that, are we? We need to push back against this because it's dangerous for people. And he talks about this situation where people were put out from the church. And I think that can sound very rough. And so I think it's important to realize this happens inside the context of Matthew 18, which is not a fast process. Right? If they, you, know, you, you, you go talk to somebody, if they won't hear you, you bring a friend. If you bring a friend, they won't hear you, you take it to the church. If the, they won't hear it from the church, you kick somebody out of the church. I think a lot of people look at that and think, well, that's probably three days. We need to have a long suffering together. The whole concept of, of people putting, being put off from the church is really so that they'll be drawn back to the church and realize, oh, I was, I was wrong. I, I, I see that. I want to be around my church family. I need that. And so Paul encourages Timothy to engage in this warfare. I think it's important also to see Paul's heart in 2 Corinthians. At the very end of the book in, verse, in chapter 13 and verse 11, it reads like this. And we'll close here. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. That's the aim of the warfare that Timothy was to engage in in the church, is to create that environment. That environment that's safe for all future generations. And so that's our job then, is to hold faith, hold, hold fast to the, the message of faith that we have now so that it will be pure and delivered rightly to the people that we live with and we engage with now and that it will stand strong for future years to come. Let's pray. God, as we now start to think through a, a, a charge for our brother, John Nicholas, Lord, I, I pray for the deposit that you've entrusted us with, God, that you would um, show it to us clearly in your word, God, that we would have the humility to receive it openly and that we would be obedient to carry it out, God. We thank you for all that you allow us to do, all that you allow us to participate in in your kingdom. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is John Toon. I'm the associate pastor at East Shore Baptist Church. That's just a church just up the road a little bit. And I was privileged a few weeks ago to participate in an ordination council. Basically, we got together with John Nicholas and we asked him, made sure that he knew this book as well as he claimed to. And it was just a time of encouragement to encourage him in his mission and his purpose. And so right now, it is my honor to be here with you today and with John, your church family, to give you this charge. The purpose of this charge, it's a short address, kind of a, a mini sermon. It's to challenge you, John, to faithfulness in gospel ministry. You are committing today to declare God's word wherever you go. This is a high calling. It will require all of your effort to pursue this and to thrive in it. But this charge is not just for you, John. This charge today is spoken in the hearing of your loved ones and of your church family. The charge to you is faithfulness to God. The charge to everyone else here is to hold John accountable to that task. He will need your love and support 
if he is to continue in this work and to remain faithful to God. You must be there to encourage him when he is faithful and to confront and challenge him when he falters. In short, your call is to love him as a brother in Christ, to show him the same grace and encouragement that you receive from your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As I thought about what to share in this charge today, my mind went to a passage that I studied recently from Acts chapter 20. In particular, this is Paul talking to the elders at the church in Ephesus. It's Paul's farewell address to some men that he had spent a long time with. In this address, he's talking about what he did as an elder, as a church leader. He's instructing the elders on what they should do as well. And John, I'd like to challenge you with these words from Paul. The first thing Paul talks about is how elders are to perform humble service. In Acts 20, starting in verse 18, Paul says, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How you did not shrink, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is reminding the elders what he did with them when he lived with them. He was busy serving, doing the Lord's work when he was in Ephesus. He had to deal with trials and testings at the hands of Jewish leaders. They opposed his work. But he tells the Ephesian elders that he did not shrink He did not hesitate. He did not hold back when he declared the truth of God's word. He told them everything about God that he could. If it was profitable, if it was helpful for the people, and they needed to hear it, then Paul told them. That means, John, you're not to be lazy in your passion for the Lord, but eager to serve. An elder is not someone who waits for a title or a pastor but they're already engaged in teaching God's word to others and making disciples. They serve with humility. They endure suffering and trials for the sake of other people in their congregation. And John, from our conversation, I know this is what you are already doing. And so today does not change that. Today is simply the church recognizing the role in which you serve. And that role is, in Paul's words, to testify and declare repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the message to unite the church around, that message that believers need to be reminded of. This is the good news. This is the gospel. We were born as sinners. We were separated from God. But through Christ, we can repent. We can turn from sin and put our faith and trust in Jesus because only he can restore our relationship to God. This message is alone the one that can save. John, you are to unite this church or wherever you go in knowing, celebrating, and declaring that truth. And you're to continue in it every day of your life. In Paul's words, elders are to finish the race. Paul talks about how he's going to Jerusalem and he knows trials are coming. But he says this in verse 24. I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul knew that there were rough times ahead of him, but he was willing to endure those trials. John, I'm sure you know, but you must recognize that all Christians will experience trials and suffering. God uses those events to make us more like him. In fact, they're essential for our growth as believers. You should not lose hope when life gets hard, but acknowledge that any trial you go through has a purpose. Nothing happens to us that is not being used by God to make us into the men he wants us to be. And that's why Paul realized that his purpose was to persevere in life and to finish his race. Without God, Paul did not think his life had any value. Without God, his life was worthless. He refused to hold dear a life without God. His goal was to finish his life, his race, and his work. He had been assigned a ministry, a task, a godly work. He wanted to see it through. 
he was called to tell others the gospel, to testify to the good news of Jesus Christ. And he's giving every elder, every leader, an example to follow. He knew that he was on earth to tell others about Christ. It was the most important goal in his life. He continued in it every day. A gospel minister should be a man who is passionate about making disciples, about talking to others about the things of God. It's something he continues in and perseveres in until the day that he goes home. God doesn't want sprinters in the Christian life. He's interested in marathon runners. He wants those who will continue with him for their entire lives. Run with him, John. And as you do, declare the whole counsel of God. The next couple of verses, uh, Paul says I, that he is innocent of the blood of the people he's speaking to because he did not shrink from declaring to them the whole counsel of God. He gave the Ephesians all of God's word, everything that God had said. And John, that is your purpose, to teach the people of God the truth of God's word and all of his word. If we're being honest, I know for myself, there's parts of the Bible that I, I like less than other parts. If it was up to me in my sinful flesh, I would only pick my favorite passages to talk about. But as you know, that, that's, not, that's not something we've been given to do. We don't have the right to do that. Our task is to give all of God's people all of God's word. That is the task you are to continue in. Paul will go on to talk about shepherding and overseeing people, caring for the sheep that have been entrusted to them. As a pastor, you are an under-shepherd. You are modeling Christ as he cares for his people. You're responsible for the spiritual life of God's sheep. And that's important because Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin, to buy these sheep. The church is precious to Jesus. You are entrusted with shepherding and overseeing precious cargo. The church does not belong to you. It does not belong to any of the other pastors, elders, or leaders. The church belongs to God. You are to care for the flock, teach them, pray for them, protect them. In this passage, Paul talks some about false teachers and false ideas that come into the church. But since Pastor John Weathersby talked about that, I'm not going to spend time on that this morning, other than reminding you of that purpose, that when someone strays into false teaching, your job is to call them back, to plead with them. Paul says in this passage he did it with tears, to plead with them to return to Christ. And if they will not do that, then you are to protect the church from their error by teaching God's truth. Let me end with a word about God's grace. In verse 32, Paul says, Now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. As Paul comes to the end of his speech, he's commending, he's committing, he's entrusting the people he's speaking to, to the Lord's care. He's reminding them to cling to the word, to the message of God's grace. So, John, you should not stray from the plain gospel of Jesus Christ. There are many new and exciting things that churches do, and it will be very tempting to be distracted by these things. But you are to remind people of their ancient divine message, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So in Paul's view, elders, gospel ministers, are to humbly serve. They're to finish their race, declare the whole counsel of God, shepherd the flock, and depend on God's grace. And John, your task is the same. It won't be easy, but it is worth it. Your church family will be there to love and support you as you seek to know Christ and to make him known to your church and to your community. So John, to borrow Paul's words, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. May he find you faithful, not by your own effort, but by the presence of his spirit and by the work of his son. May he alone receive the glory in your life. Friends, let's pray, and then we'll enter our time of communion. Lord, thank you for this time we've had this morning to hear from your word, to learn how we should live for you, love you, depend on you, to have persevere through warfare for your sake. 
And I pray now that as we turn to the Lord's Supper, remembering your work on the cross of dying for sin, may you be our focus today and every day. May this ceremony not be about us, but be a time of remembrance of what you have done. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Now, Brother John will lead us in a